Why don't we tell me a little bit about how you left Hawaii and when you discovered you were going to the Yorktown and how you got to the Yorktown and, and how they uh, you got settled in on the Yorktown, that kind of stuff. Well, I don't, don't remember a whole lot in that area. One of the things you should recognize here is that the war period, while well, very, what would you say, pinpoint or, no, that's not the word, something very important. A lot went on during the war years, the four years of war. That's still just four years out of yeah. 65 years of flying. Yep. So it doesn't seem to, a lot of detail doesn't come out. Yeah. But, uh, well, what what do you what, remember? Just anything that comes to top of your I, head? I, I've told you there that was uh, flying at Barber's Point. Yeah. And uh, let's see, there's one thing that happened there I don't think we got to. It was about the balloon I was going to tell you oh, about. Oh, that's the right, yeah. Yeah. The Japanese were at that time launching these balloons and they had aneroid devices to drop the weights and hold their altitude and they went up and down like this and they just went up into the to the jet stream and, and hit it to the U.S. and they launched them from the right part of Japan I guess to get it pretty accurate. They found quite a few of them, not quite a few, at least two of them they found in Oregon mm -hmm. after all that. But anyhow one day I was flying and I'm just flying doing something, I don't know what, and got a call from Barber's Point and I was mm, a little bit east of there, about 20, 30 miles I guess of the airport and they said they spotted a, a bright shiny object out in that area and they wanted me to look and see what it was and went through some detail about they tried to identify something and didn't have any radar returns or something, I don't know. Anyhow, I, I, they just gave me a heading and I started going and pretty soon I saw the spot just like seeing the moon come over the hill there, mm -hmm. that bright spot over there and uh, started going toward it and it was obviously as I could start going toward it, it seemed to be going up and up and in azimuth and so I started climbing and at the same time they called and found another guy somewhere was flying a course there and he started chasing it too and we finally saw each other and uh, kept climbing and flying with full throttle all this time to get the best speed and high altitude it could. And it seemed to be getting a little, a little further away and higher all the time. And we had no idea. We didn't think balloon. I didn't think balloon. And they didn't say anything about balloon. They just said a spot and I could just see a shiny spot. Didn't know what it was. So we were chasing it and we chased it for probably 30, 45 minutes. And by that time, it was just about to get out of sight. It was so high, and it was getting higher and higher, and further and further away. And so, we both gave up. The Corsair stalled out, of, as I would call, somewhere around 43, 44,000 feet. And I, I was still flying, but just barely. And I had fell out pretty quick after that. So we both went back to base. Never did see anything, but we heard later that it turned out that they decided it was a Japanese balloon. At that time, we had never heard of this thing that landed here, the, well, all that system and everything, so we didn't thought it was kind of a funny story, mm -hmm. strange. Yeah, they were up in the jet stream, weren't they? Yeah, and they were, they sure, they were, the jet stream was pretty strong sometimes. Yeah. But that, that day, it was certainly stronger than my airspeed, the best I could do, because I couldn't catch that thing. Huh. Wow. Of course, I couldn't go very fast because I was trying to climb. Mostly I knew it was above me, so I was trying to climb mostly. So I wasn't doing but maybe 150 or 40, something like that, airspeed. But I sure couldn't catch it at that, so I was moving along. And that was, anyhow, that was out of Barber's Point. So and you were, then, go ahead. No, what'd you say? Uh, you were at Barber's Point waiting uh, for orders to go somewhere, or did you know already where you were going? Oh, no, no okay, idea. So you got orders to go. To the USS Yorktown? No, not from there. Okay, what happened? Well, Barber's Point is, is simply a, a training base for certain kinds of flying and, and uh, my training at the moment was night flying because I had been in the States, I had been in New England and Westerly at the night flying school and we were sent from there to Barber's Point to complete that training. And as we completed that, we were there, we were there as a night fighter unit, we'd been signed together now, there were seven of us. 
with two ground personnel and a, a complete what they call the night fighter unit mm -hmm. and then we were sent as a unit to Hilo, Hawaii. Forest Point's on Oahu and Hilo is on the big island, Hawaii itself, about 160, 70 miles away. So we all went down there and... When you were at Barbers Point, were you flying the 5N? Yes. And you were learning how to use the radar? Yes. Okay. Because that was the, that was the purpose. That was at Westerly. We sometimes had five ends, but not usually. But the five ends were out there, and we have at Barbers Point. Yeah, that's what we're trained on. That's the main point of Barbers Point. Probably was learning to use the radar properly, mm -hmm. and listen to the to the intercept procedures for the ground right. stations and all that. And uh, went to Hilo then, and Hilo was just a holding place to see where we're going next. And so I think we stayed at Hilo probably something like three weeks, I don't know, something like that. And at Hilo, we got the message we were going to uh, somewhere, in nowhere, just to the Western Pacific. I can't remember what the orders read. But anyhow, we, we just got on a a Martin Mars, the four-engine big seaplane, mm -hmm. and uh, flew for 20-something hours. I don't remember how long it was, I don't know, 20 or 30 hours, and landed. We were in the Philippines, so I was I was on, let's see, what's the island's name? I can't remember. I know the, the island's name. They're pretty good, but then right at the moment, I can't remember which one it was. And there was, there was one of the islands and that had been just taken, MacArthur and the whole army had just come through there a few months before. So it was a pretty raw place. It was a tent city and uh, we were just deposited there and uh, learned how to survive in tent city. Get up every morning early and about 10,000 people go down to this trough of, uh, like a lavatory in the bathtub. Instead of a lavatory it was just a trough in a long line and faucet every so often and and a little shelf here and you have a mirror to shave by you can shave there and, and then and keep yourself in, in shape there and, and keep in tune with things and go eat to the mess tent which is a long walk to find that and get to eat three times a day and we stayed there I think five weeks I'm not sure but I believe it was five weeks we were there wasn't very long, but it seemed like a long time sometimes. And uh, you know, I don't know how much you might watch MASH, but you, you watch that program some. And one of those things, Frank, the funny guy, got in a, a tank and got it started and couldn't stop it. And he ran over a couple of tents and things. Well, that actually happened there at that <laughs> tent city. Somebody, I don't know who it was, I never didn't know who it was, but somebody got in a tank and got it going through there. And, Ran over about a thousand tents just straight through there before anybody could do anything about it. The darnest thing I ever saw it made me doubt that the military knew what they were doing, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but uh, it was just a, a everybody standing around waiting for something to happen, you know. And then one day, suddenly we get a piece of paper to get on board the Yorktown. And we, so we go down to the, to the beach and the dock there and get in a. a, a, a what do you call them, a, a admiral's boat, what do you call that? Captain's gig? Gig, that's what it is, mm -hmm. gig, gig, you know. And uh, we'll get in that and go quite a ways. I, I remember the impression it was a long ways to and finally came around the corner uh, out of the harbor and saw the big carry there. I knew that's where we were going, so we pulled up alongside that and climbed up that long ladder into that. And uh, I remember my main impression at that moment was how awkward I felt because I hadn't entered a ship in David Tishon properly very many times. I didn't know I knew you were supposed to salute, but I didn't. I just watched everybody else see what they're doing, and so we went through that and got got on board and got assigned a, a room and a, to live in and a red room for my squadron. Is that when you found out it was the Yorktown? No, I knew the okay. war order said it was the Yorktown before okay. we went out there. I knew it was Yorktown. 
Now this well, was I didn't a, know the Yorktown from any other carry at that time. Yeah, but this was the New Yorktown because the other Yorktown no, had been sunk at, at the Midway. Time. I hadn't followed the war at sea that closely. Okay. No, we, we didn't see much newspapers. I didn't. So it was a pretty new ship when you got on it. Yeah, it was very new. And uh, anyhow, I got settled in there and, and got assigned. We found out after we got there that we were assigned as a night fighter unit to a fighter, a day fighter squadron, which was VF-88. And then shortly after that, <coughs> in meetings, with those people in the red room, the day fighter group, we just did everything. We were just part of the group, did the same thing they would do every time. And so, found out that my old instructor from Florida, when I first got to F6s in Melbourne, Florida, was the executive of that VF-88. And he was the executive officer. Uh, a friend of his, apparently, he was, he was a Navy Annapolis man and pretty well acquainted in the Navy, and uh, he knew a Cromlin family that was out of Alabama that was big Navy heroes. The oldest, there were five brothers in that family, and they were all Navy pilots. And the oldest one had been in combat when I was still in Melbourne back then, and he had come there to visit with our, our instructor, Malcolm Cagle, because they were friends, family friends. And he came down there and flew with us on a gunnery mission out of Melbourne. And uh, he, I remember his, I don't remember exactly what it looked like, but his face was all scarred where he'd had a, some injuries during his, his combat period. And uh, we flew a gunnery mission and, and they loaded each airplane with different colored tipped bullets. They painted the tip of the bullets different colors, yellow or blue or something, and it depends on the color you would come down after the gunner mission and they'd have the, the banner that you shot at come down and they'd go through and count the number of holes of each color and they could match that to the airplane and which pilots, how many hits each pilot got is what it amounted to. And I think we had 200 rounds per gun when, in our planes and I don't know what he had, probably had the same load to start with, but turned out in the, in the flight only one gun worked out of six. Oh no. And yet he had, I've forgotten, but I, I think it was 20 some holes in the banner and six or seven was about as much as any of us ever got. <laughs> he, I, had, I, had a, I remember the feeling then and I still have the same feeling. I don't know how good a shot he was. But I think he got so close he could have chewed it up with his propeller before he shot, that's the way he got all those holes. That was a little bit too much. But anyhow, his name was Cromlin. And that's important because when we got to the Yorktown and got a VF-88, his one of his younger brothers, Dick Cromlin, was the squadron commander of VF-88. And my friend Malcolm Cable, family friend again, was the executive officer. And all, all Navy circles were not too big. Mm. Still begin to run into people you knew eventually there. Yeah. And uh, then, well, a lot of the story has a lot of branches there, but that right there was a good time to finish that story. On the first, very first combat mission, we flew, VF 88 flew. Our night fighter unit, some of us were attached and just on the schedule board who was flying where, flying that, and Malcolm Kegel had pulled myself and my friend Ted Hansen into the lead group of the VF-88 and had us flying near his position in the, in the formation. And uh, so on that flight we got to altitude and cruising in formation and ran into clouds and when we came out the other side of the clouds the uh, Dick Cromlin, the squadron leader, wasn't there. And uh, Turned out after we got back after the mission, got back and everybody debriefed and everything that his wingman had run into him in the air in this position. And Dick was here and his wing was here. I can't remember his wing was named. I can see his face, but he had gotten too tight in somehow. Maybe slipped or didn't look. wasn't watching what he was doing. I don't know any of his propeller cut right into the fuselage and, and cut the severed the tail on the squadron leader's airplane. 
and he, of course, went straight into the dream. But it was right in the clouds and nobody saw it but this wingman. He told about it when he got back. So that was a Cromlin that went down. That was a Cromlin that went down. Very famous family, but he was a commander and he was squadron commander. And immediately that day when we got back, my instructor, Malcolm Cagle, was squadron commander. Hmm. He became squadron commander and he reformed all the positions and put me on his wing and my friend Ted on his left. And I've forgotten what the guy's name that gave Ted for a wing went over here. And we four flew together then for the period of our life on the Yorktown. Hmm. When you got to the Yorktown, it had been a while since you'd done a carrier landing. Did they give you, send you through a little training then or did they just send you on a mission? No more training. No more training. Hmm. The last training we had was out of, and carrier landings was out of uh, Westley, Rhode Island when we went on board a, a jeep carrier in the North mm -hmm. Atlantic. That was a winter time and it was very rough and cold. And that was when I first ran into Malcolm Cable as the executive of that VF-88 because VF-88 was sent out to that carrier on the same trip out that our group from Westley was, mm. which was just night fighter unit. And we were together and right there and did our training together out there and then we didn't see him anymore till Hilo away. Hmm. So what was, uh, so how long were you on the Yorktown then? I was trying to think the other day. I got off in, in, uh, in September of, of 45, of course. That's easy because the surrender was August the 15th mm -hmm. and, and we went down to Okinawa. The ship went down to Okinawa out of Tokyo Bay and picked up a whole bunch of Marines and we went straight back 10 days from Okinawa to the States. So I was in in San Francisco in the very first days of September and got off the Yorktown there and never to get back on. <laughs> but I can't be sure when I got on. I, I think that it was in the latter days of, of November or December of 44. So mm -hmm. let's say six, seven, Maybe eight months, I'm not sure exactly. So what was a typical mission like? What do you mean like? Well, I mean, every, every mission I'm sure was different. Um, you, How many planes were, were there going and what was it like? You were, you were ground, you were uh, radar controlled or vectored and you no, used not these? In, not in those days. Okay, tell me about what happened. Well, and let's see, if I just pick your points there. Uh, how many airplanes? The Yorktown at that time, they started out the Yorktown type carrier, class carrier, carried normal complement of 90 planes. Depending on the airplanes, it could carry more F-6s than it could TBMs, but 90 planes of combinations, SP-2Cs. Okay, hold on, let me let me stop this.